Welcome to CC, the classic car show. In this episode, we explore a very large car museum with some unique and exciting vehicles. We get behind the wheel of a quirky French classic that has a hold on many hearts across the world. Also on the show, we take a closer look at some of the classic Italians of yesteryear and their unique design. Plus, a classic of tomorrow with a long pedigree. A very fast, very sleek cat from the UK. And we test your classic car memory in Know Your Chrome. So sit back, relax and enjoy the journey as we hop in the driver's seat on CC classic cars. Some cars encapsulate a certain style, evoke feelings of desire with their timeless lines. Some classic cars just look like they belong in an art gallery. This isn't one of those cars. Just some of the names this unique vehicle has acquired in the many countries it's been sold include the Ugly Duckling, the Duck, the Goat, Flying Dustbin, Tin Snail, Little Freak, the Frog, and even the Student's Jaguar, whatever that means. This is a fine example of the Citroen 2CV, commonly referred to as the Dolly. The model is called a Dolly. Uh, it was a model um, produced so that they would uh, appeal to the uh, female uh, gender. And my word, they do, because I get a lot of waves and smiles, uh, but I'm assured by my friends that that's not me that they're smiling and waving at, it's the car. Often called the Der Chevo, or two horses, relating to its original two horsepower motor. The 2CV was designed before the Second World War, but production never got into full swing until the war was over. The first Citroen 2CV rolled off the production line in 1948, and a legacy was born. Considered the icon car of France, the 2CV was designed as the French people's car, an economical alternative to the horse and cart, and its simple but innovative design, technological advancement for its time and unique looks has cemented its place in history, not to mention its quirks. Uh, the gear lever is not in the normal place, it comes out of the dashboard, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't worry about the gear lever position, it's the most uh, uh, easy thing to use, uh, very easy to use that. Um, it's got the ventilation system and uh, you wind the knob and it opens the flap at the front and you push the windows up at the side. Uh, it's got central locking, uh, unusual because you can reach all four doors from the driver's position. Uh, the, the locking mechan mechanism for the, for the doors, uh, you turn the key and then you try and turn the, the door handle and it just spins around doing nothing. So that, that's your, uh, your locking mechanism. The suspension is super soft, uh, so soft that you have to, if you have two passengers in the back seat, uh, you have to uh, wind the headlights and you can do that from the, uh, from the driver's position. Tilt the headlights up and down uh, to, to compensate for the load in the back. It's been said the suspension was so soft in the 2CV so French farmers could put a basket of eggs on the back seat and drive over a plough field without any braking. We're not sure about that, but they must have done something right as the car remained in production for 42 years. So many may be surprised just how old this classic is. They never changed the basic design. The body is still the same uh, design from 1948. Uh, people look at the car and think it's from the 1960s. No, the last year they made it was 1990. Ours is a 1989 car, actually built in Portugal. That was where the last of them were built. The Citroën 2CV was so good in the first place, it wasn't really necessary to change it that much. The only concession they made to modern traffic was to enlarge the engine. Although I have to say, I have to say that the, the car is not really a, a, an autobahn or auto route car. It, it, it can't. It, it'll sit on about 100 kilometres an hour, but it it's more comfortable on byways, uh, relaxed driving. Originally released with a two-cylinder air-cooled 375cc motor, the 2CV was never considered a powerhouse. Even when the engine capacity was almost doubled to a modest 602cc, performance can be described as underwhelming. The 2CV was built in France, Belgium, the UK, Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, 
Portugal, Spain and Slovenia. A total of 8,830,679 two CVs were manufactured, the majority of which were sold in Europe. They're not too hard to find, and prices are generally related to the car's condition. A friend of ours in Victoria who's a rabid Francophile loves his French cars and he has had this one for about nine years. We had said to him, look at any stage, if you want to sell it, please put us on the top of the list and we're lucky that our number came up for it. Here's a challenge for all you classic car fans. Know Your Chrome gives you a peek at some close-ups of classic chrome. Look at the shapes. Do you recognise the lines? Can you tell which car sports this shiny styling? It's too early for clues. But we can tell you it's a car, it's a classic, and it's very, very cool. Look closely, and we'll give you more hints later in the show. Next on CC, the classic car show. The ultimate classic car collection. And a close look at some classic Italian design. Making CC classic cars. We've noticed that there are generally three distinct design styles for classic cars. British car design had its own direction, especially in the late 50s and early 60s. The US had its own unique design style, most obvious over the same period. But one country is synonymous with good design and beautiful lines and it's Italy. Some of the world's most desirable cars have come out of Italy, and many other countries have used Italian designers or design houses to help shape their futures. This is a stunning black 1965 Lancia Flaminia GTL, built between 1957 and 1967. The Flaminia had quite a wide model range. It came as a Berliner or saloon a four-seater coupe designed and built by Pininfarina, and there were two models by Carrozzeria Touring of Milan. The GT, a two-seater with a short wheelbase, and the GTL, with a longer wheelbase and two token seats in the rear. Only 295 of these GTL cars were built by Carrozzeria, and so are quite rare. There were two further models by Zagato of Milan, a sport and a super sport. An Italian car just challenges you to drive it quick, snappy, don't hang about. The handling of those cars is just beyond description. The sound of the engine, the way they rev up, uh, the style of the body, all those things come together and make Italian cars unique and that's what I like about them. Maserati is another name that springs to mind when we think of Italian design. The Maserati Mirac was first introduced in 1972 and was essentially a lighter, cheaper, less powerful version of the Maserati Bora. More interesting is the designer of both cars. Giorgetto Guigario was named the car designer of the century in 1999. He designed for Bertoni, Ghia and then his own company, Ital Design Guigario. Giorgetto Guigario has been responsible for the look of hundreds of cars from Ferrari, BMW and Bugatti to Hyundai, Seat and Daewoo. Alfa Romeo was recognised as one of Italy's premier car companies, with a long line of classic cars still out on the roads today. Alfa Romeo often worked with designers and coach builders outside of the organisation to broaden its appeal and add value to established lines. The Alfa Romeo 105 115 series coupes were built by the Italian firm from the early 1960s to the mid 1970s and cemented Alfa Romeo as a manufacturer of well made, affordable sports coupes that were an absolute delight to drive. They had style, grace, speed, and cost a whole lot less than the competition. Other classic Alfa Romeo cars were built on the same chassis and running gear by external design houses. One of the more famous of those vehicles is the Alfa Romeo Spider. Many say this design is the ultimate Alfa Romeo in terms of style, and the styling was done by Pininfarina, the famous Italian car design firm. In fact, the Spider was the last design founder of Pininfarina, Battista Farina, was involved with. The Spider is one of his typical designs with the low bonnet line and uh, the enclosed headlamps. Um, and the typical Farina badge, of course, worn uh, on its flanks. 
Another of these cars was the Junior Z, a car that was way ahead of its time in terms of styling, built by Zagato. Zagato were at the time a specialist coach builder and considered one of the more radical design houses in the land. Most of their work was destined for the racetrack. And the Junior Z is considered the first Zagato design vehicle intended for general road use. A design reminiscent of the modern hatchback. And finally, what you are looking at here is a Lamborghini Miura, one of only 300 or so left in the world. 764 Miuras were built between 1966 and 1972. About 730 more than Lamborghini had first planned. The Miura was an important design step for the Italian car maker. Three engineers, Italians Guillaume Paolo De Lara and Paolo Stanzini, and New Zealander Bob Wallace developed the prototype in their own time. It went on to be a hit at the 1966 Geneva Motor Show and body stylist Marcello Gandini got most of the credit. Marcello went on to design the Lamborghini Countach and cars for Citroen and Alfa Romeo while working at the Italian design firm Bertoni. And lastly, some other classics designed in Italy include the Volkswagen Carmen Gear, the Jensen Interceptor and even the Volvo P1800 although that's still up for debate. Porsche has had a long line of highly desirable sports cars that have all gone on to become classic cars as they reach their 40-year maturity. There are a few models of car though that can continue to turn heads whilst the original cars are well and truly embedded in the classic car genre. The Porsche GT3 is one of those cars. Originally, the 911 GTRS was the most desirable of Porsches in the early 1970s. Now it's the 911 GT3. Classic lines, an evolution of classic design, a definite classic of tomorrow. And if you're a lover of classic cars but can't get past the guilt of owning a gas guzzler, then fear not. A hybrid Porsche GT is coming soon, featuring two electric motors and the kinetic engine recovery system developed for Formula One. Porsche 911 GT3, a classic of tomorrow. Michael Finnis has an enviable collection of classic cars. But there is one car that takes pride of place in his public display. A spectacular bright red Jaguar XK120 Sports. A car that is highly sought after across the globe. Well, the, the first thing that attracted me when I was young was the performance of the car. Uh, the, the car was so much faster than anything else on the market. In fact, it was the fastest production car in the world. Um, apart from the performance of it, it's just such a wonderful car to look at. It's a work of art. Uh, in fact, if you park them in the street when they were new, uh, they would draw a, a crowd, and the likes of Clark Gable drove them, Sterling Moss raced them. Uh, so they were a, a worldwide phenomenon when they were released. The car was the first sports car produced by Jaguar post-war and its success really did take the company by surprise. 
the vehicle is essentially a test car for the newly designed dual overhead cam straight 6 XK engine. Because it was only a show car and there was only going to be a few built, they built them in aluminium and they caused such a sensation at the motor shows when they uh, put them on display that they had to put them into production and of course then they had to use steel uh, and, to, and to get the steel they had to export the cars so the cars then went all over the world. A total of 242 XK120 Sports were produced in aluminium over an ash frame. Yes, that's right, under all this gloss, even in the 50s, they were still using timber in cars. Just over 12,000 steel bodied XK120s were produced. They included the sports model, like you see here, a drop head coupe and a fixed head coupe. The sports or roadster remains the most collectible and it has a lot to do with the car's performance. As far as driving the car is concerned, in its day it was wonderful. It was perform exceptionally because it was a lot quicker than anything else on the market. Uh, the gearbox was very strong, slow synchromesh, uh, four speed. Um, it handled quite well for a car of its age. Probably the only thing that let it down a little was the brakes, but you got around that and you knew that they weren't going to be that good. Um, but if you compare it to later model sports cars, of course, uh, it shows its age. So apart from being in the fastest production car of its time and not being able to stop when you wanted, what's the best thing about driving a Jaguar XK120 Sports? The, the best thing about owning a 120 Jaguar is possibly because A, I always wanted one when I was young and really didn't think I was ever going to own one, but I was lucky enough to be able to do that. And uh, you have a car that uh, uh, had wonderful performance, was very rare, uh, and very well accepted and everybody loves them, so they're just a great car. So how well did you go with your first peak? How well did you know your crime? Here's a quick update. Did you guess it right away or are you still pondering? Take a look at these shots. We're showing you a little more of the car here, so you should be able to pick it. The answer is coming soon. Next on CC, Classic Cars. A huge collection of motoring history. And we reveal the Know Your Chrome mystery car. Since 1965, millions of people have enjoyed discovering their motoring heritage at the National Motor Museum, located in the small rural town of Burwood in South Australia. A museum that has grown over the years to become the largest collection of vehicles in the Southern Hemisphere. Many are surprised that a collection of this magnitude and significance is located in Australia, but it's no surprise to Australians. Cars are a way of life. Motoring, uh, well vehicles have shaped the country in many ways because Australia is such a big country. Uh, vehicles have helped us uh, connect our communities together. Uh, in some cases communities are vastly um, great distances apart so uh, they've been uh, significant in that way. Uh, it, they're also about um, social history uh, including family holidays and um, you know just memories of uh, growing up we all at some stage drive or use a vehicle in our lives, so it's something that we all have in common. Of course, it's not just Australian vehicles on show, although there are plenty of those too. CC Classic car fans may recognise many of the vehicles that are featured on the show, as the National Motor Museum was instrumental in helping us gain access to many of the cars we have covered. We have vehicles ranging from the vintage and veteran right through to the 50s, 60s, 70s. We've got uh, muscle cars of the 90s, and we've got sports cars, trucks. We've got significant vehicles like um, Tom Cruise's Leyland Badger, which famously went up the Birdsville track over and over. We've got Twiggy's Lamborghini. We have cars that we have on loan from private owners. We have cars in our collection that have been donated to us. It originally started as the Birdwood Mill 
as a privately run museum and it was uh, motorcycles in fact. First established by Jack Keynes, a motorcycle dispatch rider for the Army, the Birdwood Mill Motor Museum was a result of his obsession with bric-a-brac and machinery, especially motorbikes and cars. It was first opened on the 28th of November 1965. Two years later, a fellow enthusiast, Len Weigel, purchased a share of the museum and together they expanded the collection to include more cars. Through the concerted efforts of some foresighted enthusiasts, the state government was persuaded to buy the museum as a public asset, rather than risk having the collection broken up and lost. Over the years, the collection has grown and the museum has expanded to house all these amazing vehicles. From those humble beginnings, as an old motorcycle collection in a disused flour mill, the museum has evolved with the help of the South Australian Government to become one of the world's premier historical vehicle experiences. And it's still growing, with tens of thousands of visitors coming to relive a piece of their own motoring history. Uh, we have a team of volunteers and staff that look after the vehicles. Uh, we have people that polish chrome and people that clean behind the ropes as we call it. Uh, which is a big job in itself with over 300 of them to look after. And uh, we also have people that look after the collection in the workshop, uh, getting the vehicles running for what we call our driven collection. And uh, we like to keep some of them running so that people can see them on the road and that they can participate in events such as the Bay to Birdwood, uh, the very famous uh, car run which happens in September. We had to ask, why has a government bought and maintained a collection of cars? It seems the kind of thing wealthy philanthropists do to get out of paying tax. We like to think that we're collecting for the future as well, so it's not just for now or in the past, it's for the future generations who are going to see some of the significant vehicles of the past. We have about 65,000 people through the year visit the museum and yes, they come from all over the world. Uh, we have a lot of our visitors come through events such as Beta Birdwood and the Rock and Roll Rendezvous in April, uh, ranging from families. We love to have uh, families visit the museum and it's not just for blokes, of course, it's for women as well. It's a fantastic visit for them too. So how well did you know your chrome? If you said it was a 1973 Jensen Interceptor, you'd be right. The Jensen Interceptor was a GT-class sports car, hand-built in the UK from 1966 to 1976 by Jensen Motors. With a 7.2-litre Chrysler V8 sitting under the hood, the Interceptor was a true English supercar. We've looked at hundreds of classic cars, and we could easily look at thousands more, as the world is full of old-style motoring. A classic car is not just a hunk of machinery, it's a piece of history. But better than that, it's history you can touch, feel, and most importantly, drive. And what can be better than hopping into your own special piece of history, be it a sports car, saloon, or sedan? and taking a ride into yesteryear on CC Classic Cars.